Nothing he, likes, he likes constructive criticism, I would tell you. <laughs> Is that what you want to say? From your family, you got puppies? Yes. So it's always welcome. Well, my dad was late for everything. My dad, my dad was always late. Always late. Drove me crazy. Yeah. And as I got older, I'm like, We'll call the meeting to order, but please stand up for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Clerk, will you please call the roll? Will do. Alderman Redpath. Here. Alderman Senor. Here. Alderman Redpath. Here. Alderwoman Turner. Here. Alderman Fulgenzi. Alderman Proctor. Here. Al Alderwoman DeCenso. Present. Alderman McMiniman. Here. Was Alderman Fulgenzi here by phone? I didn't uh, hear that. Mr. Clerk? No, I believe Alderman no, Turner. It's uh, Doris just, Turner. Just Alderman Turner. Alderman Turner. Here by telephone. Thank yes. you. Alderman Tylen. Alderman Donlin. Here. Alderman Hanauer. Here. Mr. Chairman, if quorum is present. Do we need a motion to allow uh, Alderman Turner to set in on the meeting? Or is so Second. Electronically. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, the ayes have it. I also just told her to mute her phone. I didn't hear you. I just asked her to mute her phone. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, we'll, I'll move for approval of the December 10th, 2018 uh, Public Utilities Committee minutes. So moved. Sorry. Been moved and second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, the ayes have it. Uh, we're down to presentations, and what we're going to do is uh, uh, I'm going to turn this over to Doug, and he's going to start off with the opening remarks, and then we'll, we'll have T come up for the inter integrated resource plan results. Um, and then we'll move on to other business after that. Thank you. Go ahead, Chairman. <clears throat> so I'd like to thank everybody coming tonight uh, to hear the integrated resource plan for uh, CBOP. Um, I want to thank T for uh, making the trip and for their efforts uh, in regard to the IRP. And, and to my staff, um, you know, uh, John Davis, Electric Division Manager, uh, Micah Bushnell, the Director of Planning and Markets, and Scott Rogers, the General Superintendent of Generation. Uh, there's a lot of hours that went into this, a lot of hard work, um, and uh, uh, so I extend a special thank you to them. So on the agenda, um, we're going to talk about uh, just a few keynotes um, first, and then we're going to turn it over to T to present the results. And then we're going to talk about next steps. So once they're done, it'll come back to me. So basically an IRP is a 20 year economic analysis of our generating units compared to other energy resources in the market. And uh, T-scope for this is strictly an economic analysis and that's it. Um, you know, one of the things that we've been saying for quite some time is that our, our coal fired units basically can't compete very well in the market. They're not competitive in the current market with the regulatory uh, regulations. So uh, this report, you know, basically confirms all of that. So public process, um, this is tonight's the fourth meeting we've had on the IRP. Uh, we've took comments at the beginning, um, basically on the inputs into the IRP, and now we're going to take comments on the, on the results. And that starts tomorrow, basically through June 3rd. In two weeks, we're going to have an open house at the Lincoln Library, 5 to 7, discuss basically the same information, but just in a more casual environment. So if people want to ask questions, stop on by. Mm -hmm. uh, we That's encourage May that. May 20th. Director. May 20th. <clears throat> and then the next Public Utilities Committee meeting, we would summarize basically our public comments. So now I'm going to turn it over to T. So Kevin Galke uh, is here from T, who's basically really done a majority of the of the, the 
project management for T on this endeavor. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Doug, and thank you to all the aldermen and the mayor as well for coming out, as well as everybody here. So as we speak through this integrated resource plan, uh, we wanted to take a few minutes to really talk about what this process is how we, and how we've gone through it, and then we'll review the results and we'll explain our recommendations. So to start, the way this process begins is TEA and CWLP collaboratively, collaboratively develop a lot of assumptions. Everything from long-term load forecasts to unit cost information to uh, different scenarios, different things that we think are useful to look at in better understanding your portfolio. Uh, and once we get that, we use MISO's MISO Transmission Expansion Plan model. Uh, it's a model that they build to justify what has historically been billions of dollars of transmission. Um, it probably takes well in excess of 10,000 man hours. It's a very, very well vetted production cost model. And then from there, we feed that through CWLP specific data and allow us to look at different scenarios to understand how different market drivers impact CWLP's portfolio. And from there, looking at different scenarios, what we find is that there are certain things that, that arise as being successful in multiple scenarios. And from there, we give recommendations and work with CWLP as they look to be able to create an action plan. So as you're planning as a utility, it's a very, very complicated process. And where you're balancing the cost of your plan, the flexibility both of your resources and the, the timelines associated with making changes, as well as market risks. Uh, it's important to note, though, with this, that what is cheapest is not always your best option. It's what is the best option across multiple overall scenarios. And through this, this is a lowest cost production model. And we view this economically through the lens of two, two, uh, through two tools, both of which are industry standard. One is total cost as deemed by the net present value of revenue requirements. So this is a total cost over 20 years. Uh, the second is a levelized cost of energy. Uh, you'll see it abbreviated LCOE. And this is a per megawatt hour basis. So it's a per unit basis, which makes it useful when we have different outcomes of, of different loads. So when your volumes aren't equivalent. Uh, as we go through this process, it's important to understand that there are a lot of risks inherent in long-term planning. Uh, one is we've seen a huge growth in the amount of renewables, and we've seen that shift the way markets have reacted just in general on a national scale. Uh, the other thing is market prices. So as we look at things like fracking, fracking has been a game changer in the market and what it's done to natural gas prices now and out into the future and the way it's impacted overall market prices. Uh, there are also considerations in here for weather. Uh, one of the scenarios that we took a look at used a very cold winter every five years and a very hot summer every five years to understand what is the impact of severe weather in a stress testing scenario on CWLP's portfolio. Uh, we've also made scenarios here to look at environmental regulations. Uh, we use one that uses the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative uh, carbon pricing to understand what a carbon tax that is vetted, that is actually in place, would do to CWLP's portfolio. Uh, across all of these different scenarios, there are also different levels of power plant retirements. So there are new units that get built uh, it, with renewables and with, with gas, as well as uh, coal and gas and nuclear units that are retiring at different rates to get a better understanding of what this looks like. Uh, we've also varied the electricity usage across different scenarios to really get a much more robust look at, at the way your portfolio would likely perform in a long-term basis. Uh, and one of the scenarios we used also includes provisions for demand associated with electric vehicle charging. So we've tried to consider as many risks as we could reasonably look at in a long-term scenario. Uh, as we look at our modeled fuel price uncertainty, uh, we've included effectively four different price streams for natural gas prices. Uh, three of those are borrowed directly from MISO's MTEP process and with updated numbers using their methodology. The last one is the NYMEX New York Mercantile Exchange natural gas price. Uh, that's substantially flatter than the others, but reflects a much flatter market. With regard to coal price, 
we have a reference case call uh, based on just a pure inflation every five years from CWLP's portfolio, a higher coal that uses 25% higher coal and then continues with the inflation escalation, and one that is a flat coal. If you saw no inflation in your coal price over 20 years, what would that mean? Uh, we also included market risk cases. So in this, we have an advanced fleet change and higher and lower rates of change in the grid, things like seasonal extremes, NYMEX fuel prices. These are all scenarios where the market is acting on your portfolio. You don't get to pick this. It's understanding what is likely to be the best case to understand what is the most viable portfolio given the fact that we don't have certainty into the future. And so as we proceed through this, you'll see some of this taking into account flexibility, as I spoke to it earlier, but understanding that there are short-term actionable items. These are things that you'll want to look at doing or CWOP will likely consider adding sooner rather than later. There are also things beyond, say, five years out that are longer-term directional items. These are considerations, things that you'll want to pay attention to, and they have a greater potential to change with circumstances. And so by using a phased approach, we have a more agile, more flexible approach that improves optionality while also reducing your portfolio risk. So now as we speak through the results, uh, as we proceeded through this, we looked at, we took a look at all of the possible options for new power plant builds, uh, as well as retention of existing assets. Uh, you'll see certain asset types here highlighted in green, including natural gas combustion turbines, solar, wind, and market purchases that were selected in at least one case. Uh, we also included things like combined cycle gas, reciprocating engines, and battery storage that were not selected economically in any of the outcomes. Uh, we also looked at energy efficiency programs. CWLP has some very robust programs and a lot of very high quality data that we could use to support this in a modeling scenario. And what we found is that, uh, that most of CWLP's existing programs, as well as some of the air conditioning rebates and social behavior change, showed value economically out into the future. <clears throat> as we look at this, both short and long term, what we find is that certain things rise to the top in multiple scenarios. Every scenario retires Dalman 1, 2, and 3. Everyone adds energy efficiency programs, and every scenario built a FIJA, Illinois Future Energy Jobs Act, applicable solar project. In the short term, the model outcomes were a little more mixed on things like replacing Dalman 4. Uh, with only 50% of the applicable scenarios choosing to retire that in the short term. And adding renewable power purchase agreements was a full 80% in the short term. As we expand that out, we see the replacement of Dalman 4 increasing to 75% out by the end of the study period and 90% adding the additional PPAs. <clears throat> so with this, we brought, I'd like to bring forth our recommendation uh, based on a lot of collaboration with CWLP to look at this, with the realization that this information, our recommendations are best based on the best available information during the study process. Kevin, before you go forward, yes, sir. Uh, we're looking at some of these acronyms for the very first time. Sure. Could you go back to the previous slide, uh, which is number 14? Yes, sir. This one. Uh, these, okay, so thank you. I, I appreciate that clarification. Uh, so the first two lines are retire Dalman 1 and 2 power plants. The second one is retire Dalman 3. The third is to add energy efficiency programs. Uh, the fourth is a F Illinois Future Energy Jobs Act applicable solar project. It's a small scale solar project. The fourth is to replace Dalman 4. And the fourth is to add uh, renewable or other power purchase agreements. A Would you power like purchase agreement, PPA. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. So here is our recommendation. Our recommendation is to retire Dalman units one, two, and three in 2020, or as practical. To retain Dalman unit four, <clears throat> at least until the next IRP period, and continue to evaluate it on a forward basis. 
to issue a renewables RFP and a capacity and energy RFP to continue to expand your energy efficiency efforts, retain your peaking units, and build a FIJA applicable solar if possible. So looking at this timeline here, what we see, yes sir. How, how big of a solar are, are you talking building? So most of what we see typically is that solar tends to be handled as a power purchase agreement, where because of some tax, tax credit structures that CWLP is not as a municipal utility able to monetize. Um, that being said, we've looked in here, it added it in 100 megawatt increments. Um, there's some economies of scale that's associated with that. Uh, but we would also recommend through the RFP process evaluating different sizes as well. Okay. The FIJA is a small FIJA. The FIJA would be smaller, yes. The FIJA, in order to qualify for the full FIJA tax credits, it can't be larger than two megawatts. Uh, as we look at this, what we find is that initially, the, the most economic solution is adding energy efficiency programs. Uh, as we move through into 2020, it's retiring Dalman units one through three, replacing that capacity. Adding the FIJA solar in 2022 uh, and beginning a 200 megawatt. We have it logged in here as a wind PPA, but again, I would advise looking at it holistically as a renewables RFP. Um, and then as we go into the out years, adding another two additional solar PPAs. <clears throat> So what does this do to your generation mix? <clears throat> As it stands in 2019, all of our renewables power purchase agreements have rolled off the books. So all of our generation is effectively coal with some small supplementation of natural gas in 2019. In 2021, after the retirement of Dahlman units one, two, and three, uh, our portfolio moves to only 42% coal, 57% market purchases, and a small percentage of energy efficiency. Uh, as we add more renewables continuing through, uh, that purchase agreement or that market purchases decreases to 9%. We add those renewables and we continue to generate using Dalman 4. By 2031, we become a little bit net long again and are a higher percentage of renewables uh, with continued growth in energy efficiency. So from a market perspective, uh, as it stands in 2019, we generate 47% more electricity than, or we are expected to generate 47% more electricity than CWLP needs. Uh, moving forward into 2021, uh, you are a 57% net purchaser from the market. That can either be purchased from the spot market or can be locked up into longer term contracts. Uh, we become a much smaller purchaser in 2023 and by 2031, we are a net seller to the market again based on our renewables. So from an environmental impact perspective, uh, in 2017, before the Crystal Lake and the partial year of Hancock had rolled off the books, uh, we were at 20% of CWLP's load as matched by renewable generation from CWLP. By 2023, on a recommendation, uh, that number increases to 47%. We reached 64% in 2029, and we're up to a full 82% of CWLP's load covered by renewables by the year 2035. So we'll talk a little bit about why these are our recommendations. Uh, one, for Dalman units one and two, every scenario retires these. And in doing so, we also avoid an additional $22 million capital expense. For Dalman unit three, every eligible scenario retired Dalman 3, and this avoids a $26 million capital expense. Uh, it's worth noting that based on our analysis, a, over 20 years, the net present value to retain Dalman 3 increases by $210 million. Uh, it's expected to increase cost approximately $10 million a year over the next few years. And for reasons that Doug will discuss later, a 2020 retirement might not be entirely reasonable. Um, but Doug will go into more of the technical considerations behind that. As we look at the retention costs behind Dalman 3, uh, what we find is that it is a 200, it, in our expected scenario, 
Uh, it is a $210 million increase to keep Dolman 3 around. Uh, that works out to $8 and change per megawatt hour, averaged over 20 years. Uh, with regard to Dolman 4, our recommendation is to retain Dolman 4 for the time being and reassess that in the next IRP cycle. Uh, one very important piece with Dolman 4 is that Dolman 4 cannot be retired based on transmission considerations across CWLP system. And the only way that you could retire it is if you replaced it by a power plant of the same or greater size. And the most efficient or the most cost-effective means of doing that is a simple cycle gas combustion turbine uh, expected to cost around $120 million in overnight build. Uh, Dolman 4 is really marginal on retirement. When we look at it across some of the scenarios, what we find is that in certain scenarios, it's economic to retire it. But in other higher power price scenarios or higher natural gas price scenarios, it doesn't. It's uneconomic to retire it. It is, it is very uh, sensitive to coal prices. Uh, if we look at this chart here, what we see is that there are three bars. Uh, the first is the high coal scenario. It is 25% higher coal and then escalates with inflation going forward. The recommended in red is just a continuation of the existing prices with inflation baked in. And the flat coal is a non-inflated price over 20 years. And so what we see is that the long-term viability of Dolman 4 is a function of CWLP's ability to negotiate favorable coal contracts now and out into the future. As we see those coal prices lower or substantially increase, the long-term viability of Dolman 4 will need to be revisited. <clears throat> uh, with regard to a renewables RFP, uh, we recommend issuing a renewables RFP as soon as possible. Uh, there are a lot of federal tax credits, uh, including the production tax credit, that are expiring soon. And to the extent that you are able to find some of these assets that are still able to capture those credits, they will likely be cheaper than almost anything else you can find in the market. Um, it's also likely that because of the build time, you may be signing a power purchase agreement that doesn't start on day one, that there's still some build out associated with that. Uh, our results added it in 2023, but based on pricing on specific projects, uh, I would advise looking at it on a more forward basis. Uh, with regard specifically to renewables, uh, it's a really important thing to note that renewables have become significantly cheaper. Uh, based on numbers from the Lazard Group's levelized cost of energy, uh, wind costs since 2009 have declined 69%. Solar has declined 88% since 2009. So now what we're seeing is increasingly across the utility planning process is that renewables are no longer just a social conscience play. They are an economic piece of energy portfolios in the utility space. Uh, we also recommend that you consider market purchases and issue a capacity and energy RFP. Uh, as it stands now, the expectation is that Delman 1, 2, and 3 energy can be replaced at a reduced cost and cheaper than what it would cost you to maintain those facilities yourself. Um, and there's also the possibility that you could still reduce your risk by not counting on just spot purchases, but by looking as we go out into the curve and being able to lock up some energy on a more forward basis, in potentially in the five to 10 year time horizon. Uh, we also recommend that you continue your energy efficiency programs. Uh, having worked extensively with CWLP staff, I was really impressed with how robust the programs are and the quality of data that they had to be able to support this. And what we found is that a lot of these programs are very economic ways of effectively replacing or deferring generation needs out into the future. And so we recommend that on an as economic basis that you expand those programs and continue to conduct more analysis into things like demand side management, uh, continued energy efficiency programs, and consider that advanced meter infrastructure may be, may be a necessity as we go out into the future to, to implement higher levels of granularity associated with some of these programs. Uh, we also recommend that you retain your peaking assets, those being factory, inter interstate, and Reynolds. 
Those units provide you really relatively inexpensive capacity and energy when you need it for reliability reasons. Uh, the Future Energy Jobs Act uh, is a state level program. Uh, every scenario built that. It is important to note that you should consult your council. There are some questions given legal challenges about CWLP's ability to qualify for it. And finally, uh, with regard to additional risks, uh, electric vehicles are a huge point of uncertainty as we look out into the future. And they represent the possibility of some of the most recent true organic growth in US electricity demand. Uh, it's also worth noting that new technologies and maturing technologies, uh, including storage assets, will be really important to CWLP's portfolio and the larger market on the whole as we look out into the future. Uh, environmental regulations are a huge piece of any power plant plan as we're looking at not just renewables but also what happens to CWLP's existing fleet and the larger market as a whole. Uh, we also recommend that you pay attention to generation and transmission changes near CWLP. Things like Emberclear's Lincoln Land and other transmission builds which have the ability to change some of your future pricing streams by adding efficiency and other pieces to the market. Uh, it's also important to note that as we look at market and fuel prices that we see things like fracking things that nobody anticipated what fracking would do. And that as we look at this and build plans now and out into the future, that we pay attention to all of the things that are going on around us as we're integrating phased approaches. And with that, that is my last slide. And I'll open the floor for questions. Or would you like to proceed, Doug? OK, perfect. Doug, what was Kevin's last name? Excuse me. Gulky. How do you spell that? G A L K E. G A L K E. Thank you. <clears throat> Doug, real quick. Has there been any analysis? I'm sorry. Has there been any analysis on any of these on what it will do to the pilot or the. Well, uh, basically. Um, if I, if I okay, that's right. Um, uh, yeah, basically what it is is, is 3.75% of the revenues. So basically once 31 and 32 retired, wholesale sales will pretty much stop. So, um, revenues you know, it, it might, I, you know, it's uh, just a quick look. I think it could be like a $300,000, $400,000 kind of a uh, deduction from the, from the pilot because it's across total revenues. Unlike it used to be, though, when there used to be like a, I, I can't remember the old way, it was like 20 or 30 percent, you know, and it was much lower, it would have had a much larger impact a few years ago. Hold on. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, was human capital factored at, factored at all into this equation? Yeah, as far as like um, our employees, as far as, uh, you know, uh, the, the labor costs and stuff. Yes, it was all included in the in the analysis and what the costs are. So that's that goes into our overall fixed costs, essentially. Since you brought that up, what about the disposition of the employees? If you retire 31 and 32, uh, what would happen to the employees? How would you integrate them either into other jobs that are open or back into the uh, world, real world? Can I address that here just a second okay. as I close? Sorry. Go ahead, Derek. Okay, um, so you know, with with T's report here, it's uh, it was a very comprehensive you know look at all the different possibilities, the different scenarios, um, and how we can be more flexible uh, to the market, and you know, as we move forward. Um, so, you know, what are our next steps? This isn't the final plan that that's you know being presented here. It's the recommendations and the of the results that that T has done uh, based on economics alone. So the next step is to create an action plan. And a part of that is reviewing the public comments, uh, taking that into consideration, and then uh, beginning the planning steps in MISO for retiring units. Um, initiating the request for proposals, basically for the renewables first, and then also energy capacity off the market. 
33 will take longer to retire versus one and two. Uh, the reason for that is there's a few reasons. One is transmission upgrades. And we're limited on what we can import, so we have to design and build transmission upgrades and to do so, uh, as well as building heat for the complex. Um, we currently get steam heat from the units, so when they're gone, we will need a new heating source. Um, shared facilities for unit three and four uh, also create a little bit of an issue that we need to plan for operational changes, so that'll take additional time to uh, develop that as well. Um, one thing's for certain, though, um, is avoiding compliance costs. Uh, you know, with 33, with 31, 32, the conversion to dry ash is uh, pretty expensive, and we will need to avoid that cost um, as we consider when, you know, the retirement plans, what they might look like. Um, and then developing a plan for our employees. So, um, you know, for those that are affected, we want to minimize that, you know, to the best of our ability. And so that's really, with the recommendations what we have right now, now we can start moving forward with how we're gonna address that. And so there's gonna be a lot of issues that we have to work through to get to that point, but now we'll be able to start that dialogue. So, uh, just as a kind of reminder here, basically for our public uh, process and the involvement, the open house again, May 20th, the Lincoln Library, five to seven. Um, public comment period, May 7th is tomorrow to June 3rd. And then the next public utilities committee meeting, we're gonna come back and review that, those, a summary of those comments and, and then have more discussion on that as well. <clears throat> And then we'll provide you know f further updates. Um, one thing of note is that T's full report and tonight's presentation are available online right now, uh, as well as past presentations. So you'll be able to go back and look at everything that was done you know in the past meetings. Give that address, uh, Doug, of the IRP at cwlp.com is what people could send in to. Okay. Uh -huh. So, uh, our website, again, it's www.cwlp.com uh, forward slash IRP, and that contains all the information for all the presentations that we've done to date, including tonight. Uh, you can email comments to IRP at cwlp.com, or you can mail uh, to our general office. Um, and then you can also provide comments at the open house um, at the Lincoln Library on May 20th. Um, overall, I think this process has been very good for the utility. Um, it's very uh, transparent, basically, for the results that we're providing. I think T's done a, uh, an outstanding job uh, with regard to that. Um, and uh, I think we'll be able to have, you know, develop an action plan that, that puts us moving forward in the right path based upon all these uh, these issues that we've raised. So uh, I'll open it up for questions on T's report. Mr. Chair, Alderman. Doug and, and Kevin. Yes, sir. Did uh, any of your study project our electric utility rates going forward if the city were to adopt, substantially adopt the recommendations made by the Energy Authority? Uh, in other words, what might our electric rates for our retail consumers be five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now? Did you do any study of that nature? No, they would, they would not do that kind of a study for the IRP. Um, and it's really too early to tell exactly what those impacts will be. But moving forward with lower energy su supply costs will definitely benefit our customers. So it's gonna put us heading in the right direction. Um, but until we have, you know, basically locked in long-term contracts, um, that's going to determine what those savings might look like. Now, what if the city council were to ask the energy authority to make those uh, potential uh, projections of uh, utility rates going forward? Uh, our plan is actually to do a cost of service study. Um, I, I do, we haven't really discussed it with T. There's many firms out there that do that, um, that uh, have a lot of experience with that as well. So we will look at multiple proposals for that when we get to that point. I think our public really needs to know what's ahead for us. Um, if we adopt these 
uh, recommendations. So I hope, Mr. Mayor, uh, that our utility devotes some, some time and attention to those forecasts. And I understand the forecast could be a range of forecasts, you know, the most likely, the least likely, top range and bottom range, but I think we need some commentary of that nature uh, for our public. Anyone else? Any other questions from the council? Mayor? You? Ralph, go. Yeah, so, so has the employees been notified, Doug, or are they, I mean, besides a, you sent a letter out today, correct? That's correct, just has, today. Has there been any meetings or any other? No. And has it, have you talked to the unions and all that too? Or I just, think, you know, those discussions have been more general, okay. um, at that uh, there's a potential for retirements. Um, but nothing specific yet. Right. Uh, you know, we really needed to have the results back. Um, and this isn't really the final, the final action plan either. Right. So, right. you know, we got to have some direction on what we can do. Uh, you know, I can say, you know, our workforce is, uh, um, you know, at the plants are, uh, are, are younger. It's, it's not, we have, you know, tons of people that are going to be retiring soon. So there will have to be a very thought out process of, of how that's handled. And then going forward, I'm sorry, one, one more question. Going forward, so where will, will, what will come before the city council? Will, will the recommendation be from CWLP and the mayor's office uh, in the form of an ordinance or, or how, how's this whole process gonna work out? I, I, I would the energy say authority uh, had done a similar uh, IRP for Springfield, Missouri. So if you'd like to talk about what they did on the decommissioning, I guess, for lack of a better phrase. So, so as we move forward with this, um, this IRP process has been a tool to help plan this. Um, that being said, this is Springfield's utility. And, and I don't feel that it would be wholly appropriate for the Energy Authority to come in and dictate a plan forward. And so I think CWOP and, and the, the people in this room are best equipped to be able to create a plan that is consistent with where you as Springfield and CWOP are now and where you want to be in the future. Alderman Donna. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I assume that the final plan will also include an analysis on the reliability of whatever route or whatever options there are so that we can determine uh, that we, you know, power's delivered. And, you know, what, what I mean by that is we've been fortunate over the last, you know, de many, many decades to have uh, four, three, three and or four units. <clears throat> and uh, we had the history and we know, you know, with relative certainty that uh, we're going to have enough power for our native load. And uh, i just like to make sure that, uh, that we are assured and the public is assured mm -hmm. uh, that uh, power is going to be delivered. I know there's major changes, a lot of unanswered questions, but uh, when we start talking about renewables, it does make, make and, and it's a considerable part of our uh, generation, it makes me, uh, renewables aren't 100% reliable, uh, meaning that it's not always sunny out, the wind's not always blowing. Uh, th there is a place and, and, and I think it, it would, fit in nicely, but we have to be cognizant of that. I assume that's going to be a part of the final plan? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think we, we you're looking at, you know, when they start increasing those renewables, that's more long-term. and the shorter run, it's not as much. Um, and, you know, as far as reliability goes, the reason we needed the transmission upgrades is so we can import more power. So without question, we need to be able to do that and then secure longer-term contracts for energy and capacity prices so we have that security. Um, now, when it comes to renewables, uh, you know, when it's, you know, we're talking 10 years out, 15 years out, that's that's a long ways out. We don't know what that's really gonna look like. No one does. Um, so do we think it could head that direction? Yes, I, mean, I think you'll, you'll see increases in, just like with wind turbines, they, they, they're building them taller, they're more efficient. Um, so you're gonna see that, that technology increasing and increasing. And I think that's where they sort of drive with MISOs and their, and their modeling. Um, they take that into account in some of their scenarios as well. well I, I appreciate that, but I, I agree with the alderman that uh, we can't make, we can't get to a, to a decision point unless we understand how this is going to impact our repairs. That's critical. Alderman Senor. And just for 
us late people, if you could put in late terms that you all just did an analysis and you're giving CWLP some recommendations on either to take all these steps or some of these steps to put uh, the city of Springfield in the best light possible as far as getting to a more productive power plant source out of CW, out of, out of the, the power, for the power plant, is that correct? That was a much better explanation than I could have given. Thank you. <laughs> so how many uh, employees will this affect? Uh, I mean, we're still working that. Um, the, uh, we're, we're trying to see if the, uh, you know, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's three of our units, so it's going to be a significant amount of, of staff that, that are affected with this. Um, and, you know, with that, I think that's, that's you know, working a plan um, to try to minimize the impacts is, you know, that's what we're going to focus on. Any other questions from the council? Thank you, Director. Thank you. Kevin. Thank you. Uh, we'll now move to unfinished business. Is there any unfinished business? Hearing none. Is there any new business that needs to come before the committee? We'll now move to uh, citizens who would like to make a comment, and I would like for you to please understand that we're talking about the IRP and that we prefer that the, we direct the comments to that. And we will, um, if you have further questions and stuff, you can, uh, as the director said, you can direct them to the CWLP uh, website. And, the, and, um, and obviously, on this, we, we seen this just like you did just now. So we don't really have a lot of answers for you. But to be honest with you, we want to make sure that we answer as many questions as we can. Obviously, on May 20th, that'll be the better time for those type of questions. And is that correct, director? So. Uh, so if anybody would like to, uh, who do we, do we have anybody for tonight uh, signed up? We do. We, uh, Deborah has signed up. Who is it? Deborah. Deborah. Deborah Kunkel. Deborah Kunkel. Anyone else care to address the committee? Yes, come on up, Elizabeth. Good evening. It's nice to see you all. Thank you for this opportunity to comment and thank you to the Energy Authority for coming out uh, and giving this presentation. I know this is something that we have been talking about for a long time. For those in the audience maybe that don't know me, my name is Elizabeth Scrafford. Uh, I work for the Sierra Club and live in Ward 6 here in Springfield. Uh, and I just wanted to make a couple comments. But first, I had um, I have good news in one of my comments. I have a question, which is uh, y'all were talking about coming back and addressing the, the comments of the IRP, which is when is that next? next a public utility meeting going to happen so folks here know when to come back again? I don't have that date yet. We just, we're doing the 20th is the open open meeting. Can they, can we address it then on the 20th? Or? Comments go through June 3rd. Okay. So I would imagine sometime after that. You know what, I'll, I'll, I'll get that, I'll try to get it out tomorrow. Sure. Okay, okay. Right. that'd be and great. I, I know we had a hard time get, getting this first one scheduled, so I just right. want to make sure folks well, know. We, we obviously wanted to wait for this to come here, so yeah. but uh, we will get it out, and Julie will make sure that it, uh, that it's, it that hits all the news agencies, and, and we'll call you. Thank you, I appreciate it, Alderman Redpath. You know, I like that. <laughs> uh, so my little bit of good news is has to do with the Future Energy Jobs Act, which came up, and the solar funding. There's been a lot of comments about whether or not City Water Light and Power was eligible for the, those funds. There was an appellate court decision that came out on Thursday, uh, where the appellate judge upheld the Illinois Commerce Commission decision that uh, municipalities and co-ops are eligible to receive FIJA funding for community solar. So I think that's great news for CWLP. It's something that we've been hoping that you all would be able to access, and I'm happy to report that you can now, or at least you can apply for those funds, and I would love to work with CWOP and help support that however I can. Um, a couple just more points. I think, you know, planning for the future is so important, and I was excited to hear the action plan, and, and you've heard me say quite a few times that I think planning for the folks that work at CWOP and understanding, you know, that that is what pays for people's medical bills and kids' braces and ballet classes and people's home mortgages, totally understand that and believe that uh, the labor unions need to be a part of that work as we're looking to the future and figuring out when's the best time for Unit 3 to be coming offline. So I just wanted to uphold that. I've said it to you quite a few times in the past, but I wanted to say it again and just remind 
remind you that that is where Sierra Club is a firm believer in planning for the future. Happy to support that however we can. I have lots of other comments, but I am going to limit them. I, do, I, I, I have to comment on the rate question, though, because I'm pretty sure I heard the Energy Authority say several times that y'all would be saving money by moving to renewables. And when we look at the cost of taking units offline, that it's, what, 200 and, and what for unit three? 10. 210, so that's a lot of money. So when we think of rates and we look, when we think of year by year, you all just had a city council meeting, I think last week, where it's $900,000 for uh, the older unit. So when we think of costs and we think of rates, when we, we're looking to the future and we're looking at an option that's gonna bring costs down, then I would make the assumption then that that's also going to positively impact rates versus negatively impacting rates. Thank you. Thank you. Don? Uh, I'm Don Davis. I no longer live in the city, but I have family that does, <laughs> and I want to uh, kind of represent them. Uh, there's one truism. You can never do merely one thing, and the corollary to that is everything is connected. So with this decision body, and if you go along with the IRP study that the T presented, and you'll be soon uh, retiring units 31 through 33, 31 and 32 first. Uh, it will have an impact on your decision making regarding an auxiliary water supply. Because simply once one or 31, 32, and 33 are off the picture, they were no longer being pulling. Uh, 5.4 million gallons a day to move ash over to the in, to the uh, landfill that's uncovered and unlined. You will no longer have those power plants forcing 2.3 million gallons a day into the atmosphere because of the increased heat from the hot water that's discharged into the lake. And you will no longer be using 2.2 million gallons a day of treated water for their scrubbers and condensers and boilers. That's 9.9 uh, .9 million gallons a day. And uh, right now you're trying to get a permit to build a lake that you claim you'll need an extra 12 million gallons a day during a 100-year frequency drought. Well, if you leave 9.9 .9 million gallons a day capacity in the lake, you only need 2.1, and I know about three or four million gallons a day is a cushion for what is called future water use from future growth. So that 2.1 can be made up pretty easily. Uh, you're going to be needing to pull the heritage phosphorus and sediment out of Lake Springfield. If you ever have a chance to meet the phosphorus water standard, or the total maximum daily load. Right now, according to test results, it's run as high as 20 times the uh, water standard. One milligram <clears throat> per liter as opposed to 0 0.05 milligrams per liter, which is the standard. Uh, and that phosphorus is attached to the sediment that is washed in the lake. That will give you some more water capacity storage. So these, what you do here with the electric division is really going to be important on the water division in terms of water supply. And it might, you know, help with maintaining the water uh, rates uh, and within reason. But you know, that's, like Springfield still has to be taken care of and, uh, and the watershed leading into it. So it may not be a break even, but you may not have to spend another 130 plus or minus uh, million dollars to build a second lake. Mr. Davis, permit. so you're saying that roughly 9.9 .9, uh, 
million gallons per day of water usage is eliminated or reduced once units Once 31 through 33 are taken off, you know, are retired or quit, quit being used. And you're saying there's additional water availability if we dredge the bottom of the existing lake to eliminate the yeah. phosphorus and the other chemicals there? You will increase the storage capacity. I'm not sure exactly how much uh, in terms of million gallons a day of, of a supply that means, but it's probably uh, one to two at, at most. Do you, therefore, do you think these proposed recommendations by the Energy Authority should be communicated to the Corps of Engineers, which is currently... Um, sure, I don't think you can do one, th you know, you can ignore what the other hand's doing here. You know? <laughs> I, I believe you should be able to understand that everything's connected, you know, you can never do merely one thing. So if you, you could, from an economic necessity, you have to retire 31 through 33, uh, that's going to immediately, or within the next few years, give you, uh, oops, I'm out of time. Mr. Davis, I believe you retired, but what was your uh, professional um, experience in life? Well, I started out as a chemist, and uh, then I had an environmental education program within the Department of Transportation. Federal or State Department of Transportation? State, the Illinois Department of Transportation. So we did stuff about the basic laws of ecology and how things are interconnected. Thank you for your comments. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Mayor. I'm sorry. Yeah, I appreciate uh, Mr. Davis' uh, commitment and his comments, especially with connectivity. And the water debate will uh, be a separate issue. You know, you have to separate out the issues, and right now it's the electric side. But with regards to uh, connectivity, you know, Chatham, they went on their own. They've called us, I've always said at least three times, but I think it's more like eight to 12 times to supply water. What we need is a backup water source. And so that'll be a debate uh, once we make the determination of uh, our electric, how we're moving forward together. We'll, uh, I'm sure that's gonna be a discussion at a future point in time, which uh, everybody will be able to weigh in on. Paul Messino. Uh, Mr. Davis made some comments about water usage, but he, he didn't give us any any, any backup information on how long uh, the power plant, the, the plants would be in use, what it would take for them, for us to get to those amounts that he listed. So I don't, you know, if, if you would bring some, some factual information on that, Mr. Davis, as far as how long it takes to generate that, that much usage for those, the, the amount of gallons of water that you gave in your presentation, I'd appreciate that. Did you hear that, Don? Well, how, how did you how did you arrive at those usage amounts for the gallons of water per day? And if you you know is that continuous usage of, of 31, 32, and 33? And I mean, you just kind of put those numbers out there and didn't give us any basis. Is it? But just get that for me if it's a per day usage of, or if it's if it's running for eight hours a day. Okay, thank you. Great. Go ahead, Mike. Um, it was great to hear the plan laid out tonight and the work that was put into it. There's an opportunity here for Springfield to advance itself into the future and maybe be a leader, maybe not in the state of Illinois or the whole state of Illinois, but at least the central part of Illinois. Um, the um, worry about uh, employees losing their jobs. Maybe it would be a good time for Springfield to look into job retraining for these people in advance of these programs coming on, instead of saying, okay, these programs are here, now what are we gonna do with you? So there's an opportunity for the city to look at that. There's also an opportunity for, like, uh, Springfield, Missouri, as, uh, as going to renewables and how they even out their peak load is through battery technology. And it evens out, it helps even out the load through storage. So Springfield could be looking at projects like that. Um, there's a lot of things Springfield be, can be doing as this project moves forward. It saves a lot of money on up ma uh, uh, maintenance and repairs on one, two, and three. I know four is hard to retire but you work to that retirement, and you then can market this 
to other places, other people, to say that your city is doing this ahead of time, ahead of the state if you want to, but you can market this as a city to attract people to your city, to attract businesses to your city. As um, someone can tell you, I forget the city where uh, Google moved into in South Dakota because of the big, a uh, lot of wind energy that's produced there, because they wanted their business to be run by all renewable energy. Right up the road here, there's a wind farm that sells a huge amount of its, uh, or is going to be selling a huge amount of its electricity generated to uh, GM in Detroit. There's opportunities to market this stuff. All you have to do is take advantage of plans that are put out there and move forward with them sooner than later because later everyone else is going to be there and you'll just be one of many. Right now you got a choice, one of many or a leader. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, we'll move. Uh, yeah. um, Angel Sides, 2124 Blackhawk Road. Um, I just had uh, a few questions um, concerning uh, basically, is it, would it be possible that the city would be able to have like a split contract between the local co companies to compete for a rate to keep our uh, electricity rates low? I mean, we, we just passed a an ordinance when I was here the other day to to uh, have more, you know, branch pickup. Is it possible? Is I mean, I guess what I'm asking is what is the process to to do that or, um, you know, to um, maybe pass an ordinance where we turn to solar roads. That's something I talked about when I campaigned. Um, the, the current coal contract is through, I believe, December 31st of next year. So its uh, contract it is with uh, Arch Coal Company. So there is no ability at this point for the city to entertain uh, splitting that contract because we have a legal obligation uh, with that company. Uh, in the future, that's a decision that would have to be made sometime after December of 2020. Um, well, I mean, but isn't it possible that you can be talking about what we're doing before that so that the residents of Springfield should have a say in what our rate's going to be? And it's obvious to me that we've been overcharged in the past, and we had an, the Eli report that was kind of suppressed or hidden from the, the city council. And so I'm, I'm just wondering what the process is, you know, for, for, for that and, and to turning to alternative energy to actually pass ordinances that do that. Because solar roads are something that we could use or, you know, we could use the, the funding from the Department of Public Works to offset the cost of that. Mr. Chair. And Alderman oh, Hanauer is first. First of all, I, I don't recall being, sorry, first of all, I don't recall us being kept away from the Ely report. I think we all had a couple times to see it back in the day during the coal negotiations. Um, the other issue that we have is, uh, you know, we, we looked into that contract and the better, the, the best best price won. Um, there were other things besides price that that was in effect at the time. And they missed some mandatories and 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 they couldn't haul ash back and because uh, I, I don't believe at the time they had a permit for us to, to be able to go back with our ash. Now it was a mandatory I believe in the contract that they couldn't fulfill. So that's that's one issue. You know Going forward, concern but is it, wasn't wasn't the other 
offer a much no, um, it wasn't. cleaner burning coal that would no would it was when you when you figured in all the factors they figured all that in and and mayor i i could be wrong but they they figured all that in based on price and and i still say we did best on what we what we chose the best that was there so um now as far as going forward real quick you know, one of the concerns we have is this is going to cut down on the on the amount of coal that we're we're buying, and so um, you know, as T pointed out, you know, the price of coal may go way up because because we're not able to buy the quantity that we have, and uh, you know, we've got a lot of a lot of ancillary jobs that uh, are are part of this power plant, and it's not just coal miners; it's electricians, it's it's you know, um, you know it's, it's it's plumbers. It's every everything that, that works out at that plant. The engineers, everything, and you know people need to understand that when this happens, it's not just going to be people out in the power plant that potentially could lose their job. It's going to be people in Sherman that's part of that part of the coal mine. It's going to be truckers that that haul the coal. It's I mean you got a large group of of, of people that are, this is going to affect. But the big thing is, we're we don't know how much what our what how much coal we're going to really be buying. If you go buy this, it doesn't look like very much to me, because we, we'll be all renewables. All of them minimum. Uh, we're locked into a contract at present, so that's where we're at at the present time. In the future, the idea of splitting coal and taking some coal from Elkhart and taking other coal from uh, Montgomery County or wherever the other coal mine might be. It, on the surface of it, it sounds like a good idea to increase competition, but in private conversations with our utility in the past, what I've been told is that the, uh, those, that the coal from those different mines burns differently um, in our plants, and the, the settings have to be set. Uh, precisely for the, the kind of coal that we're taking from each plant and that we, we don't want to have to reset um, the settings when the, when the coal from a different plant is burned, not knowing when that different coal might be um, pushed to a, to a certain uh, um, dolmen. So um, if, if that information has changed, then I'd like to know about it. You don't have to answer now, but um, if that's an accurate reason why we wouldn't consider a, a split contract. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like the council to hear that again, not necessarily now, but um, when you, you think the time is appropriate. Mayor? Yeah, I think it's been said by Alderman Hanauer and McMinimum. It's uh, really uh, once we make the decision of the path forward, that's going to be considered at that point in time. And when we are negotiating or if we uh, go to the RFP process with regards to the coal contract, that uh, all is going to be taken into consideration. I think if all units come down, I think it's 50 percent, isn't it, of the coal? How much does that amount to, if you'd like to give that number? Yeah, the three yep. units are What was that? 50 percent. 50 percent. So that's all, that's all going to change the dynamic of uh, okay. what the price of coal will be provided at. Thank you, ma'am. I was going to say there. This is very complex, and the, what T has identified is that the uh, interrelationship between the coal price and the operation of Dolman 4 is direct. So a higher price coal price will force Dolman 4 off uh, basically no longer functioning just because of the sheer operating costs. On the other side of the equation is that the coal mine has to have a certain revenue to, to stay in business. So these are very complex. The ability to split uh, two, if there's 600 or 700 or 800,000 tons of coal, to split that into two different functions would probably be not economically viable because then you have to sustain the infrastructure of both mines. However, that's a process we're going to have to go through next year as all this kind of shakes out, as all of the, as the council is better informed on what the policy decisions are. Uh, and that will all work through the normal, just through our normal purchasing process and so on. And my other question was, is there a way to pass an ordinance where we have, as a city council, we're not taking money from the coal industry because uh, certain aldermen have done that and in the past and this last election, and I think 
that's a huge conflict of interest. And I mean, you you pass that branch ordinance so fast, but is something like that should be passed right away as well, in my opinion. Thank you. Anyone else care to address the council? Come on up. Thank you. Uh, my name is Scott Allen. I live in Ward 8, and I work for a statewide nonprofit utility watchdog organization. Uh, we're a utility consumer advocates. So uh, based on my experience there, I would like to make a couple of comments. And then, um, like Elizabeth, I work a lot and I'm around a lot with the um, policy of trying to get Illinois toward generating more renewable energy. So there are a couple of issues there also that I'd like to uh, share. Um, there were a couple of things that as, as a consumer advocate, we pushed to get lower utility bills. And one thing I recognized in T's uh, findings was the emphasis on energy efficiency. And that's something that um, we talked to the consumers of the investor-owned utilities that um, the most, the quickest, most proactive step they can take toward lowering their utility bills is to increase their energy efficiency. And in any discussion about renewable energy in the future, um, that discussion can't really happen without having a serious uh, evaluation of how we use electricity and how we're able to conserve that. And also um, the potential of uh, consumers generating part of their offsetting their own loads through rooftop solar or through community solar programs. And with that uh, ComEd decision coming down earlier this week, there's a huge opportunity for the city to take advantage of those um, uh, credit or those uh, incentives in the Future Energy Jobs Act. And hopefully at some point in the future, um, uh, those credits will be expanded. The other issue that I've noticed a lot, a lot of communities are struggling right now to figure out what's going to happen to displaced coal workers, whether they be in power plants or they be in mines, the electricians. Um, and it's not really a question of if, it's when that's going to happen. There's there's no denying that eventually this is going to go away. So I would I would encourage you to, instead of looking at how we can continue to keep those jobs around, a lot of communities are finally starting to realize that they have to work on transition, to transition those workers into um, uh, other fields, renewable energy fields, or renewable generation fields. So I would encourage uh, taking a serious look at that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, do we have any executive session? We do not. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you.